Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to Genomics Light, um, Antimicrobial Resistance in Focus with Christine Gwinnett. So my name's Fran. I'm the Education and Learning Manager at the Welcome Genome Campus, working for Connect Welcome Connecting Science. And um, so what we'll do, well, we've got a few more people coming in. We'll just quickly introduce you to what we're going to be doing tonight. So our uh, events aim to help everybody to explore the science of genomics and what it means for all our lives. So we respectfully ask that everyone participates in a spirit of curiosity and sharing, respecting different views, identities and experiences. So I will be moderating this uh, platform to ensure it's a safe and inclusive space for all. So I'll be monitoring the chat, I'll be monitoring the questions um, and just making sure everything's okay. So um, if you're new to Zoom and haven't used it before, you'll see there's a bar at the bottom. Um, so there's a couple of icons that we're going to be using. So we will have the chat um, box, which is the little speech bubble. So you can use this to ask Christina or I um, any questions or if you're having any te technical issues or anything, just, just pop it in there. But if you specifically want a question um, answered, we do recommend you use the Q&A um, button which is the two speech bubbles um, so these are any specific questions for Christine there we do also have a closed caption um, box at the moment I'm not I'm not the technic, technic, most technical of people so I'm not sure if I've got that working but you may see at the top of your screen this is being live streamed and if you click on that it will take you to a transcript box um, on a different screen so you've got two options there um, if you want to see see the transcript of the session okay so I hope that all makes sense again pop in the chat if it doesn't make sense so we always like to, um, if you're a regular, you're probably used to this screen already, but if you're new, we always want to know where in the world you are. So um, the Welcome Genome Campus, where the Welcome Sanger Institute and Emberley BI is based, is based in a small village called Hinkston, just outside Cambridge. Um, I'm at home, I'm in Bury St Edmunds, which is about 30 miles up the road from there. Um, so we really want to know where in the world you are. So if you could use your chat box, tell us where, where you're watching this, uh, this webinar from today, and we'll see who's the furthest away. So you can pop it into the chat, Norfolk, Cambridgeshire, Devon, lovely, oh, Cyprus I saw whip in there, London, Wales, I think Cyprus is winning at the moment. Oh, I saw one from India, goodness me, you're all spread, lovely. Cottenham, lovely, love that one. Nigeria, oh crikey, I think that might have won. Oh no, could India's probably still in the lead there. Wow, we've got a lot there, we've got a really international audience. So welcome everyone, we're so pleased to have you online with us. Uh, I saw Belgium there as well. Hi to everyone in Belgium too. So fantastic. That's amazing. So I'm just going to do a quick uh, quick screen here. So um, what you'll find about all of the talks, um, if we're doing quite a few of them, is that a lot of them focus on genomes. So some of you may know this, some of you may not, but the genome is essentially an organism's complete set of genetic instructions. It's the information to make a functional organism and every genome contains all that information to make that organism grow, develop, to function basically. So in the series that we're going to see this academic year, we're going to have a different spotlight on lots of different areas of genomics that focus on different aspects of that. Now if you want to find out a little bit more about genomes, genes, DNA, we've got a website called yourgenome.org and this is great, it's got lots of animations, lots of information, so if you're new to this topic and you want to find out a little bit more, this is a really good um, resource for you and um, the day after this session you'll get an email which will have some links, learning links in there as well if you want to carry on finding out more about this topic as well, so probably you'll have some your genome links in there as well. Now, again, if you are new to the programme, we do have a lovely back catalogue of uh, Genomics Light from um, earlier this year. So you can access all of these by going to Genomics Light, um, this bit.ly link, and I'll put all of these in the chat in a second. But we also have a full YouTube playlist as well. That's quite long to type out, so I'll pop that in the chat list as well. So again, we've had lots of different topics, infectious diseases, cancer research, human genetic variation, biodiversity and evolution. So there's lots and lots there for you to uh, look at as well. Brilliant. Oops. So this is our plan for today. Oops. Sorry, not doing very well today, am I? So um, we're going to be looking at antimicrobial resistance. So we're going to have a brilliant 30 minute talk from Christine and then um, we'll have an opportunity to ask any questions. So remember to use that Q&A. 
Um, then Christine's going to tell you a little bit about her career as well. So how she's got to where she is, where she's going, you know, what, what her, her future vision is. Um, and again, if you want to ask any questions there. So our goal is to finish about no later than 5.45 today. But don't worry, this session is being recorded. If you'd have to dash off early, it will be made available on our YouTube channel and on our website as well. So without any further ado, let me stop sharing my screen. Let me introduce you to lovely Christine. Here she is. And Christine, I'm gonna hand over to you so you can share your screen. Thank you so much, Fran. And welcome everybody and hello, I'm Christine, as Fran said. I'm gonna share my screen now. Uh, otherwise I'll be very awkward with just introducing myself with nothing else. Um, Fran, can you see my screen okay? Okay, great, thank you. Um, so yes, I'm Christine. I'm based at the Welcome Genome Campus, based specifically at the Welcome Sanger Institute. Um, and yeah, today we're talking about antimicrobial resistance. So I'll just go straight into it because this is a 30 minute talk and let's not be more awkward than I am normally. <laughs> uh, but any questions, uh, put them in the chat. There will be questions throughout. But you know, if there are any you know, experts in antimicrobial resistance in there, please jump in and, and and ask away in the chat box and Frank can let me know if there's any difficult questions that I may or may not be able to answer <laughs> or I'll refer to uh, I'll refer to you to where to find the information from right so we'll start off with a poll first of all um, have anyone here been ever been prescribed uh, antibiotics for an infection and then felt days felt better after a couple of days like almost instantly if not the next day you felt immediately better just give me an answer and um, I'll go for it. I'm really curious because usually when you get a really bad infection, you call the temperature and the fever, and then suddenly you have antibiotics and you feel better. So let me know. And also, you, you don't have to answer completely if you don't want to. Um, do I have to vote? No, I don't. <laughs> Just checking. We've got a nice, uh, quite a lot of people have said yes. So 77% so far have said yes. 7% yes. uh, no, 11% uh, mm -hmm. never had antibiotics and 5% say not sure. Can I just commend everyone who's never had an antibiotic? Well done, congratulations. You've relied on your immune system to do its job. And again, the immune system is really, really fantastic in that if you give it enough time, it can really, uh, it can it can fight a bacterial infection. To everybody who said yes, obviously you needed antibiotics. There comes a time when you actually do need antibiotics when the infection just is too much. And so you do need antibiotics. And if you've never had any antibiotics or you're not sure, also okay. And if you go through life never having had antibiotics, I commend you and you know you have an amazing immune system that is doing its job. And uh, that's kind of the feel of today's talk that you'll find out the reason we get antimicrobial resistance is because it's slightly misused. So I can't go into antimicrobial resistance without jumping in and talking about bacteria because that's what we're targeting. Um, so bacteria is ubiquitous, meaning it's everywhere in the world, absolutely everywhere. If you lick your hand right now, you're probably swallowed some anti uh, anti uh, some bacteria. It's 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 also it's everywhere. It's on your skin, on your phone, er absolutely everywhere. And uh, what I like about bacteria one, it's a single cell organism and it's very small. And one you can see here, I put a tree. Now this is called in evolutionary study or genetics. It's called a phylogenetic tree. We call it a tree because its relationship is to understand the relationship of each bacteria to another or a back within a bacteria. So for example, if you've got a family tree, that's also called a tree, like the relationship between your parents or your siblings, your kind of cousins, that can be written in a tree. So it's essentially how we look at relationships generally. And this is one of bacteria and all of these are bacteria at the top. At the bottom here is archaea and the eukaryotes and sort of the higher eukaryotes. But what this is just to show you, you don't have to see and read all of these. This is just show you the diverse, the diversity of bacteria that we have. There's over 30,000 that have been studied in detail, but that only accounts for 2% of, of all the bacterial species that are known and also fully studied. Uh, but again, it's not being seen by the naked eye. And also this doesn't include ones that have not been discovered, ones that are in sub 
subterranean region, so also deep in, under the sea or frozen in permafrost, as well as, you know, extraterrestrial. Maybe there's bacteria up there. We don't know. We should ask NASA how that study is going. And um, so that's it's the bacteria is absolutely everywhere. You can't escape it at all. Um, and one thing I say that it's ubiquitous because it can harmly live with us. It's a symbiote or semi symbiote. So it can live quite harmlessly with us. And I'll give you examples throughout the talk. But also, it can cause infection and it's usually opportunistic. And by opportunistic, we mean it can cause infection when it's not supposed to. For example, if you run around and you get cut, suddenly this is your first barrier. By the way, your skin is your first barrier against bacterial infection or viral infection, anything. And as soon as you break the skin, that is an opportunistic time for bacteria to be like, mm, this is nice and warm and full of food. I'll just start growing exponentially. So whereas your bacteria, your skin prevents that type of growth because it's quite dry. But as soon as there's blood or any other fluid, it starts to enjoy the warmth and the, the, the moisture. And, uh, out competes and grows very quickly and that's when we call it an infection so if your wound gets infected it's because the bacteria have just gotten out of control and your body can't quite control it and a uh, fun fact bacteria and the fastest growing bacteria is about 20 minutes so every 20 minutes it doubles so you can start with one cell and then after a whole day you've got millions of cells and it's it's an exponential growth which is why you can see if your immune system isn't quick to act it's it'll actually get out of control quickly and that's when those who have taken antibiotics you, your doctor thought thought it fish to give you antibiotics to just help the immune system catch up to to clear that infection so again in the chat box I, just in case you've fallen asleep already this is just write your answers in the chat box i'm really curious can you think of anywhere absolutely anywhere there's no wrong answer here by the way um anywhere where you can find the largest amount of bacteria i'm just curious what we get as answers um, and then, Fran, if you just let me know what, what kind of where people are going out with the answers. Sure. We've had door handles, um, hospitals, landfill, yep. the, the flusher for a toilet. Oh, um, yes. Phones, toilets, toilets are coming up. The gut, someone yeah. said the gut. <laughs> Abattoirs, we've got some cracking ones here. Shopping, shopping cart handles, possibly. Sewage, yeah. uh, the stomach, um, got a couple of those uh the kitchen bathroom yeah. bins the phone someone's phone screen you know um the uh you know if you're your touchpad a school yeah um hospitals yeah so yeah there's some cracky ones it's soil public chairs the whole earth and ass that's Ooh. a good one or someone's put the ocean lucy k's put the ocean as Ooh. well some really interesting <laughs> ideas here coins a doormat yeah Oh, all the things. I really like them. I'm going to touch on a few. One, I'm going to save the, the PR for hospitals. Hospitals are actually really clean. Funny enough, they're always super clean. I'd, I'd say you've got more dirt on your phone than the hospital. That, your, your phone is pretty dirty. Let me just warn you there. So um, try not to like, yeah, don't, don't think you're safe from the phone. And also like I've put here the, the keyboard is really dirty. Another one that somebody said, and I thought that was also quite interesting, was the stomach. Funny enough, the stomach has such really low pH from your stomach acid that very few bacteria can actually grow. It's pretty limited to maybe two species. Vi viruses are pretty bad. They can survive that. But bacteria, I think it's only one that can survive the stomach acid long enough to get to the gut. And then that's when you get food poisoning. So that's what bacteria do. They survive just about long enough in the stomach acid, which is quite a harsh environment. And then it kind of goes to, but the one that loves stomach acid is Helicobacter pylori. So people who have uh, gastric ulcers is caused by Helicobacter, which loves low acidity. So that's a that's a bacteria that's evolved to live in your stomach. Also because there's no, nothing to outcome Competed, it's just by itself in the stomach. Um, another one, the person who did say the ocean, awesome, that's actually really cool. Probably lots of bacteria that have never been discovered there um, by deep sea divers waiting to be caught there. And one thing, the toilet brush winner, everyone who said anything to do with the toilet is a good thing. And that relates to the person that said gut, because the gut actually has probably the most bacteria you've ever had, and good and bad, but all full of bacteria, chocker full of bacteria. And fun fact, Bacteria actually help you digest food. You know, if without without bacteria, we wouldn't be able to digest any um, grass, to be honest, grass and anything that has roughage. So any vegetables we eat, 
bacteria actually help us digest those complex sugars, which we would normally not be able to digest. We can digest simple sugars like sucrose, you know, like glucose and chocolate and things. But as soon as you have complex sugars that are in corn, anything that's hard and roughage like that's we can't digest that so bacteria help us so well done i love that little exercise um and i'm glad people say their phone screen very dead um so we'll keep moving forward that was just a fun little um event as i've said you can have bacteria that's kind of a jekyll hide story where it's good in some instances and can be bad given the opportunity so a few of the good ones as we mentioned the ones that live in the gut happily help you digest things and also prevent bad bacteria actually colonizing. So out of competition, because the gut is in itself just a, a layer of epithelial cells and endothelial cells. But then when you populate it with other bacteria, other bad bacteria don't have room to come in and just kind of uh, grab hold of your uh, epithelial cells and to be able to infect you. So it's actually beneficial to have bacteria so it outcompetes anything that's bad. And this is yogurt is actually just full of bacteria. It's how you create this fermentation process of milk to be able to get yogurt. And um, there's companies that have created yogurt that's it's largely lactobacillus in yogurt, but lactobacillus lives in the gut normally, but then it's much more complicated um, to create, recreate gut bacteria in a in a yogurt. So I know there's companies that say, you know, take Danone or whatever, which is good, but then it's the, the complexity of the type of bacteria you have in your gut is really complicated and actually it's it's from when you were born so it's it's all my gut bacteria is very different from anyone else's uh, but one thing I would say if you ever get antibiotics you've taken antibiotics uh, I remember my mom used to say that she's a nurse and she said you know just take um, after your course of antibiotics try and eat yogurt just to give you some good bacteria in a gut and kind of normalize your gut bacteria. The other place, as I said, is your skin, which is really, there's tons of bacteria and like fungal stuff. Especially if you live in tropical regions, there's a ton of uh, fungal on your skin that naturally live there. I have it because I grew up in a tropical region. So it's just, they're just there and living quite harmlessly with me. But these bad ones, and I've put here, I didn't put any bad infections. I mean, I don't encourage anyone to Google bacterial infections. There's lots of, yucky yeah exactly yucky images and i think oh to save everyone's ready you want to be able to have dinner tonight so i just put an eye infection this is a simple ocular infection that is caused by staph um but it can be caused by pretty much any bacteria and it's, this is an infection of the conjunctiva which is that film that covers your eye and it's a really because it's your also first line of defense is also where it gets infected so that's what i think the americans call pink eye because of the pink but it's just a conjunct, it's just conjunctivitis, to be honest. And you normally would need just a simple antibiotic to clear this, but sometimes uh, just they'll tell you not to use like towels with the same eye because you can transfer infection between both eyes. Uh, but there's also E. coli in a lot of things. And E. coli is one of the things that lives happily in your gut, but can get you very sick. And even something like parsley, uh, E. coli lives in everything in salad, uh, water, anything. So you can get really sick from it and specific type of E. coli can cause quite infection. Anyway, that's enough of infectious bacteria. I will go into resistance in the next slide, I think. But I wanted to cover before we move forward and why, and the reason why we have a rise in antimicrobial resistance. It's not just a rise, it's actually quite dangerous at this point. It's called, in some circles, it's called the next um, pandemic, which we now from this year, we know COVID was a pandemic, but antimicrobial resistance is truly a global problem. Uh, and the reason why, you know, when you're ready to take antibiotics, the doctor is very, they're not always just going to give you antibiotics because it has to be quite a very serious infection. And also they know when to give you antibiotics. Sometimes when you get food poisoning, you recover quite well. In fact, for food poisoning, you would not be given antibiotics. Your body will recover quite well. So you're usually just told, just better out than in basically and just continue visiting the toilet and you recover within five to seven days with a bacterial infection fun fact if it's a one-day infection it's usually a virus that's caused it but bacteria it's usually three to five days of quite uncomfortable trips to the bathroom but then when it's more serious and it gets into the blood or the brain past the blood brain barrier, then we're you require some sort of IV antibiotics. And that's when you probably be in hospital to be able to take these type of very strong antibiotics. Um, 
to get you better. And there's sometimes in some very few cases there's prophylaxis, but that's a very specific, unique group of people. So prophylaxis is very, very rare. Um, but those are known people that require this type of treatment. So before I go into what antibiotic resistance is, first of all, to understand what an antibiotic is, I'll go kind of into the, the grandfather of antibiotics. This is uh, Sir Alexander Fleming in his lab at Imperial. In fact, actually he was St. Mary's at the time. And how we discovered antibiotics is he was working in his lab. This is where you grow bacteria in a petri dish like this. And he'd left the lid off and the window was open. And so he came back the next day and something like this. So this is the bacteria that he streaked onto the plate. And this is a particular medium that you grow bacteria. It's just a mix of sugars and salts and just allows the bacteria to grow really well. So what happened, this kind of, this fungus came onto the, oh, my mouse is playing it. This fungus rocked up onto the plate of the bacteria. And then the next morning he realized, oh, this ugly thing, the fungus is growing, but this sort of halo bit, there's no bacteria. And this is what we now call the zone of inhibition. This is the region where the, this fungus is producing a compound now known as penicillin that kills the bacteria. And this fungus is actually called penicillium. So it also exists, it's ubiquitous, it's everywhere. But this was the beginning of understanding that fungus is actually good for us and it does produce in some instances really, really powerful um, antibiotics that kill bacteria. So that was the beginning of um, antibiotics to be honest and a very exciting time. Um, and I'll go a bit into this and why we, we this zone of inhibition is really important today. It's not, it's a beautiful look. And as you can see here on the left, um, I'll describe what exactly this is. So this is the plate that I said before that has that medium that bacteria like to grow in. The hazy yellow bit, which is here, is the bacteria itself. So this is E. coli. And then when you put these white dots, these are actually different antibiotics put there. And you can see here there's a zone of inhibition. So this is the region where bacteria do not grow. On the right is a bit more of a serious one. So again, this is the similar E. coli, but has acquired a lot of resistance. So meaning there's a very small zone of inhibition. Um, if I were a patient, to be honest, I would want to get this one because you can be treated with anything. This one, you are very limited with what drugs. In fact, none of these drugs I'd be confident to be treated with. So you can see the E. coli grows quite happily in these zones. Um, I'll show you here. This is actually a picture taken from my PhD. Uh, this, we have a really nice program that measures this zone of inhibition because this, the, di the diameter of this is, gives you a specific figure that is used internationally. So when you give this figure, whether I'm in London, New York, India, Nigeria, which is one of a few of our participants are in, you have, it's a standardized way that we can measure resistance. So by knowing the, the, the zone of inhibition, we know how resistant a particular drug is. And there's a point that there's a cutoff. So if it is exceeding a particular diameter, you cannot treat that patient with that drug because they will fail, um, they'll fail um, therapy. So for example, you wouldn't be able to treat this patient with this drug because it's completely resistant. Uh, and in this instance, this is E. coli and this is ampicillin. So another question time. Uh, so are all bacteria harmful? This is just a simple question. Yes, no, sometimes I'm not sure. Just throw in what your ideas are. Hopefully I've not bored you to oblivion. <laughs> Well, they're, they're flowing in. Um, so oh. far, we've got about 83% of people saying no. We've got 17% saying sometimes. Yeah. And no one so far has said yes. And no one has said not sure. So we are all looking pretty good. Absolutely correct. I love it. That's exactly it. Um, to be honest, there's no wrong answer from no, yes, not all bacteria are harmful, uh, but there's some that are just harmful. But then again, I think all if you answered anything but but yes, then you are correct. <laughs> so thank you for that. Exactly. Bacteria uh, sometimes are not always harmful, but there's some that are quite harmful to the human being. But those are very rare. And I'd say that these are especially the ones that produce a toxin. So for example, E. coli, and this is why they say you know, kind of cook your meat all the way through. There's a particular E. coli that I think I've included here that produces a toxin that 
basically as soon as it's released, it kind of eats away at your gut and that's why you get food poisoning. Um, and you only need, and salmonella also acts that way essentially. There's some salmonella, you only need a few bacterial cells. I mean, you're talking 10 bacterial cells and you'll get very sick, so with diarrhea. So what is antimicrobial resistance? So WHO defines it as ant antimicrobial resistance is, is resistance of a microorganism to an antimicrobial drug that was originally effective for that treatment of infection caused by it. So this goes back to that zone of inhibition I was saying. So if it previously was susceptible to the drug, and I'll go back a little bit with my slides. So if it was previously like this, and then it goes to that, suddenly that organism is resistant. And in fact, in this case, it's multi-drug resistant, meaning there's different classes of drugs on here and it's resistant to all the classes. So this is, I would even go as to say, this is pan-drug resistant. So when it's resistant to three or more classes of drugs for E. coli, it's called multi-drug resistant. If it's more than three, so that's four and above, it's called pan drug resistant and pan drug resistant um, antibiotic, uh, sorry, pan drug resistant bacteria are really hard to treat. And those are the ones we would be terrified to have in hospitals because even though the hospital is very clean, there's bacteria that have evolved to live on plastics. Uh, for example, Acinobacter baumannii. When you're in a hospital and you're intubated for a long time, uh, this particular bacteria likes to hang on to plastics and it has evolved to be resistant to most alcohols, UV light. So it's really hard to get rid of once you have it in the hospital. So whoever said the hospital was kind of right, but otherwise it's very clean in the, in, in the in hospitals. So when you look at antibiotics and one, how quickly you develop resistance, if you look here, so these are the different types of classes of drugs. So ignore the names, unless you know them, go for it. But the different colors represent the different classes of drugs. So there's quite a few that are floating around in the world at the moment, but you can see since 2005, probably after this, there's maybe two more classes of drugs that have come out. But this, this slide has rarely changed and that's sad for me and also everyone in our industry because like there's no new drugs we are all recycling various types of drugs in and out but there's only very few that have been created from 2005 um, and what happened as soon as you introduce an antibiotic you immediately get resistance so for example sulfonamide was the longest i mean this was you got a full 10 years since the drug was introduced before you started to see resistance Penicillin, which is what is the one that uh, Alexander Fleming discovered, was discovered in the late, um, in the early 19, like mid 1940s. And then five years later, complete resistance was seen. And you see this story continue. And this one is within the same decade, methicillin, you saw resistance. So bacteria are constantly evolving to get resistance to these drugs. So anything you introduce, they will counter it. And even now with newer, uh, we've called them polymyxins, and that's where you're fighting the drug. You get resistance. Uh, if you expose the bacteria long enough, you will get resistance. So it's a very, it, we're always trying to play catch up with the drug and trying to outsmart it, but anything you do, we are always outsmarted by bacteria. And what are the causes of resistance if you think about? It? So there's ways, and this is an, uh, a poster from the WHO that was released a few years ago quite a few years ago now. But one of the main things that continues to persist and the kind of the risk factors of antimicrobial resistance is one over prescription of drugs. And if you see this, you know, this is why you limit it in all forms of industry and your GP would be very reluctant to give you antibiotics unless you really need to, because the moment you expose these bacteria to the, to the drug, resistance persists, right? And you will get resistance, especially you should also always finish your course of treatment which is why they say if you've been given antibiotics for seven days, you'll feel better after two, but you have to finish your course. And I'll show you a, a diagram as to why you have to absolutely finish your course, because you want to clear the infection before other bacteria can come in and help the good bacteria come in and help and grow. But also your immune system can catch up in time. And to, for you, to be honest, that's about the right time. So your immune system really kicks in from day three, which is why you're, the courses are mostly seven days. Again, this is it, finish your treatment. Uh, again, overuse of antibiotics in livestock. So livestock is slightly different in that um, when one cow gets mastitis, as mastitis is infection of the udder, 
uh, it's really hard to contain the infection. So usually you have to treat the whole herd. So again, it's trying to keep infections low by keeping clean. And it's hard because the udders are at the bottom and there's a lot of fecal matter around and E. coli hangs around, as I said, everywhere. Again, poor infection control in hospitals, and this is very hard to clean, lack of hygiene. And this is what's so great about, you know, uh, recently, you have to keep washing your hands. Washing your hands, most food poisoning is from the fecal oral route, and I, I don't think I need to explain that further. You can get what that is. And also, we lack of new antibiotics developed, even though there's a way of, you know, there's a lot of push to get new antibiotics developed, but it's also really hard to develop these drugs because bacteria are very good. They can circumvent anything. Um, so again, I'm going to go quickly into a question time. I hope Fran can assist me with this and the next poll. Um, so what would you describe, um, or would you prescribe antibiotics for? Would it be for a viral infection, a bacterial one, a fungal one, or all of the above? This is somewhat of a trick question, <laughs> but there's no wrong answer here. We're among friends now. So we've got, again, they're all flying in. There's one leader, which is to treat a bacterial infection. Okay. Um, we've got a, some, a few have put all of the above and we've got a couple that have done a viral infection and a fungal infection as well. So, but yeah. bacterial infection is definitely the leader with 93% of the votes. I would say the 93% of the votes are completely right. And anyone who said any of the other ones are also right. So even though uh, that's why we still call it antimicrobial because microbial implies small organism, right? Micro, small. <laughs> Um, and though antimicrobials were developed for bacteria in general, antifungals and antivirals are also microbes, but then antibacterials are, are very specific to the, oh, antibiotics are for bacteria. But there are some antibiotics that have been used for fungal infections, and some have been used for malaria, for example, like the cephalosporins, which is CTX especially, has been used to prevent malaria. Uh, and there's some viral infections that work okay with, it's some speculation, not very clear, but again, it's all of the above. But to be honest, when you're in the height of infection, there's specific antifungals, antivirals, so you're not completely wrong, but also I would just stick with bacterial infections. So no one is, no one is wrong in this answer. <laughs> all is right. Christine, so there was a question that I've sort of been finding a good time to answer it, and I think this is a good time now. So um, Anas has asked, what's the effect of particular drugs on gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria? So I'm guessing, is there a, do different drugs target different types of gram-positive or gram-negative bacteria? Absolutely. That's a really good question. In fact, I think I have a slide coming up that has ah. it, but they're absolutely two separate drugs. There the, the, are some drugs that work for uh, gram positive bacteria and then some that work for do not work at all for gram positive. And I'll give you a reason why. Um, ah, it was actually my next slide. Who is it? Does this person hanging on in my apartment? <laughs> <laughs> How did you know? Um, so, yes, so there's two different types of bacteria if you don't know. So, there's two classifications gram positive and gram negative. Gram negative, actually, the gram stain is a crystal violet stain that was invented by Hans uh, Christian Gram. And what happens when you stain the bacteria with um, the gram stain and then you wash it off the gram negative bacteria appear pink in color and then gram positive appear purple the reason is because if you look at the structure of the cell wall the gram negative bacteria it has this outer membrane a very thin peptidoglycan layer and this is a very complex sugar it's a really really complex sugar and then this is the inner membrane and then if you look at the gram-positive bacteria, they don't have the outer membrane. It's just a very thick peptidoglycan layer, but it also has very complex LPS structures and, and sugar structures. So this helps them as well. And then they have an inner membrane. The reason why, and this I didn't include a slide for this. So when you have antibiotics, actually a lot of gram-positive bacteria are naturally resistant to the drugs that go into that would be treated for gram negative because of this very thick peptoglycan layer. Nothing, almost nothing can get through, only very, very small molecules can. So that's why we've got a, a array of drugs like vancomycin that are really, really small that can be able to get through here. 
and be effective against gram-positive bacteria. But again, it's very limited for gram-positive bacteria. Everything is usually for this. And the, because this is an easier membrane to get through, the peptoglycan is thin, there's a lot more drugs, a lot more array of drugs for this. But on top of that, because there's more drugs available to treat gram-negative bacteria, there's a lot more resistance in gram-negative bacteria. Um, whereas these ones are intrinsically resistant, these ones are not. So to answer your question, absolutely, there's selections of drugs that are different for gram-positive only because it's naturally they can't get through this barrier. I hope I answered your question, um, but it'll still it'll come into play a little bit in another slide, but I think hopefully I've covered that um, question. And again, so that intrinsic, now this is, goes back to the intrinsic. So gram-negative bacteria, I know I said in my previous slide that gram-positives are intrinsically resistant to some drugs. Some gram-negatives are. And I'm gonna pick one of my favorite ones, but what is intrinsic versus acquired? So intrinsic are bacteria that are naturally resistant to an, uh, to an antibiotic. So they haven't done anything. They've not been exposed to a drug, but they're just naturally uh, resistant to a drug. And I'll show you in my next slide. Whereas acquired resistance is one where through various mechanisms, the bacteria acquire resistant to a drug. So this could be mutational. And I'll show you another slide of that. So this is natural where the bacteria has done nothing. For example, your skin, that's your natural intrinsic resistance to outside forces. And then this is acquired. So intrinsic drug resistance, I'll pick serratia master sense. Um, this is a, a bug that is naturally resistant to quite a lot of things. It's pink in color. So if you've ever wondered what this pink thing is in your water bowl, so you usually get it in stagnant water, on toilet bowls, showers. There's a, it's a beautiful pink orange color that you see in your bathroom. Um, it's actually, it's everywhere. It's in water. It's in, it's everywhere you can find it. It's actually, and it's quite harmless if you drink. I'm not say drink this toilet water bowl. No, you get very sick because there's quite a lot of bacteria in this biofilm, but it's in uh, literally everything. Yes, bleach gets rid of it. So most people add bleach here, but bleach, uh, as soon as the water is heated up, it's uh, bleach breaks down and obviously the bacteria grow. The second thing, uh, bleach disintegrates after a while. So it's not, it's not a stable compound. So again, the bacteria will just wait and then kind of grow again into this biofilm. But this is pink in color. And I just thought that's an interesting, Kind of you can you all have seen this beautiful pink color, which is not very beautiful on your toilet. So just add some bleach and they'll die. Um, but what is uh, cool about serratia? It's naturally resistant to quite a lot of things, and this is because of the cell wall structure. And I'll show you this in a second. But what this, as I said, is completely healthy and lives harmlessly with us. But it can cause very very severe opportunistic infections, usually skin infections and eye infections. Burns and wounds. So when you've got extensive burns in your body, and this I'm talking you know, is 30% over burns, uh, usually you'll get infected with serratia master sense. And this is quite a devastating um, uh, infection, as is meningitis, pneumonia, and the most severe is blood infections. And I say this because it's really hard to treat serratia master sense once you get infected with it, because it's naturally resistant to a lot of drugs. And now it has acquired resistance to other things. So it's a really hard um, drug, uh, bacteria to um, treat. Now, going back to intrinsic resistance, why do I say it's intrinsic resistance? So this is, again, the cell wall of a gram-negative bacteria. This is the outer membrane. This is the inner membrane. Uh, and what happens when you uh, expose a drug to it, it kind of gets through either through porins. It works through the porins. So porins are ones that like you normally use it to get like let's say water in, nutrients in, and then it goes through into the bacteria and it's fine. But drugs, we, as humans, we've kind of used this same system to be able to get some of the drugs in, but some drugs can work through uh, the cell membranes completely fine. They get into the cell, uh, in the cell, and then they can infect their, their anti-infective um, bit there. But what happens with serratia and master sense, they've got this cool thing called the efflux pump. Actually, all bacteria have this. And for humans, for example, you sweat to get rid of toxins and your liver also gets rid of toxins and you kind of use the bathroom, go for number one or number two to reduce, to remove toxins. Bacteria have, this is their version of removing any toxins inside their cell. So they can pump it out and it's called a pump because it requires some energy and it literally is a pump that just shoots out things that are toxic to it. And what happens when you expose it to a drug that it's intrinsically resistant to, which is a lot of them, it just pumps it out. So as you can see, the drug comes in, which is a, a penicillin. And as soon as it comes in, this 
pump sucks it up and takes it out. So again, you will never kill this um, uh, bug with this type of drugs. And these uh, cholestin is a, actually a last line drug when usually used in ICU because it's quite a dangerous drug, but it's also really effective. But again, for serratia, it's completely resistant. So it's really hard to treat this particular um, bacterium. But before I go more into how it acquires resistance and how other ones talk, it's easier to talk about drugs in terms of targets. And that's how we develop drugs for to treat anti, to treat bacteria. So there's major classes of drugs. If you remember from my previous slides, they're in different colors, but I'll quickly describe. This is the cell. This is just a simple cell. Ignore this is just the cell wall, and this is the inside of the cell. So as you can see, this is supposed to be the nucleus. Um, this is just folate is. A, how the bacteria um, synthesize a, a type of protein. And then this is, again, protein synthesis. So what we target mainly is cell wall, which is what, when you get IV antibiotics at the hospital, you probably get a cephalosporin or carbapenem. And this is what they target the cell wall. Once it gets into the cell wall, it prevents it making the peptidoglycan layer. So it prevents the cross-linking and that mesh is what makes it strong. So once it prevents and makes it really loose water even bursts the cell. So that's why I guess really we can die. And then when you've got the protein synthesis, if you prevent protein synthesis, the bacteria can't grow. It can't do anything basically because proteins means also enzymes. It means growth. So the bacteria ceases to grow and you basically freeze it in time. Same with DNA synthesis. You just freeze it in time and then it can't grow. It can't do anything. And then your immune system comes up and mops it up. Same with the folate synthesis. That one, it's actually, it's, Folate synthesis is what they use to create. It, it's part of to create the DNA molecule, essentially, or RNA or anything. So if you stop this, the whole bacteria ceases to grow. Again, it dies eventually. Um, and again, if you attack the membrane, it weakens, weakens it. So even water can burst the cell and it dies. And same thing with protein synthesis. So these are, you can all kill the bacteria by either completely killing it or seizing it so that the immune system comes and mops it up and kind of destroys the bacteria. But when you develop resistance, there's two ways, as I've said. One is mutational. And I'm going to show you a little video of why mutational one is really interesting. So what happens is even in life, even in our bodies, you acquire random mutations. Some of them are completely do nothing. And some of them are advantageous. And this is how you know bacteria gain resistance that's useful to it. So it's random mutations. But when they're exposed to the drug, one random one can be perfect and causes resistance. And so we call that a drug resistance mutation. And that's what I will describe in the next few slides. So these are mutational resistance that suddenly it was completely susceptible, caught one random mutation, and then boom, it just became resistant. And you should not normally get this with drugs that target DNA synthesis, like ceprofloxacin. So hopefully this works. I checked it earlier. This animation may not work. So that is it. This first slide is showing you that it was growing happily, exposed to an antibiotic, and it got this mutation, right? So this is just a random mutation, sorry, before the drug. And it's a random mutation that is completely fine, hasn't harmed it in any way, so it's just kept it. And that's why it's different from its neighbors. When an antibiotic comes along, like ciprofloxacin, it kills everything, but the one that this was an advantage mutation and the bacteria is like, oh, this is cool, I'm still alive. And then what happens after that is, boom, it just starts to multiply and grow because it just normally would. And this is how you compete and you get a full drug resistant population whereby you only got one random one that was resistant to the drug. But apart from my very rubbish slide, I am going to explain to you. So I first saw this video in about 2012 from the Kishoni lab from Harvard Medical School. This describes perfectly and this I, does much more than I can do. In fact, if you've heard nothing today, watch this video and it shows you how bacteria evolve, but just by acquiring random mutations, grow and become the actual resistant population. So I'm gonna press play. Oh, I don't think I shared my, my audio. So I'm gonna stop sharing for a second to share my audio. Is that okay, Fran? Okay. I just to say it. while you're doing that, we've got um, we've got some great questions um, in the Q and A's, but we'll, we'll we'll ask them so don't, we're not ignoring your questions we're going to ask them when at the end of these next few slides because there's some really great ones here okay okay i hope i can do this at the same time this might be 
a bit chaotic, but let's, I don't know if you'll be able to hear my audio. This might not work. Uh, can you hear the audio? Yeah. So we ended up building was basically a Petri dish, except that it's two feet by four feet. And the way we set it up is that there are nine bands. And at the base of each of these bands, we put a normal Petri dish thick agar with different amounts of antibiotic. On the outside, there's no antibiotic. Just in from that, there's barely more than the E. coli can survive. Inside of that, there's 10 times as much, 100 times, and then finally the middle band has 1,000 times as much antibiotic. And then across the top of it, pour some thin agar that bacteria can move around in. The background is black because there's ink in it, and the bacteria appear as white. First, you see they spread in the area where there's no antibiotic up until the point they can no longer survive. Then a mutant appears on the right. It's resistant to the antibiotic, it spreads until it starts to compete with other mutants around it. When these mutants hit the next boundary, they too have to pause and develop new mutations to make it into 10 times as much antibiotic. And then you see the different mutants repeat this at 100. And after about 11 days, they finally make it into 1,000 times as much antibiotic as the wild type can survive. And so we can see by this process of accumulating successive mutations that bacteria, which are normally sensitive to an antibiotic, can evolve resistance to extremely high concentrations in a short period of time. So that was wonderfully explained by uh, one of the postdocs in Kishoni's lab. But I wondered, uh, Fran, were there any questions you wanted me to answer now before we move on? Uh, with me, um, yeah, so this this is good from, from Danny. When the bacteria mutates to become resistant, does its appearance change? Can we see it's resistant or assume if the infection doesn't clear after the antibiotics course is complete? Yes and no. So sometimes it depends on the type of drug it's becoming resistant to. So again, ones that target intracellularly, like the uh, the ones that target DNA replication, the outside may not change visually, so you can't see it, but ones that target the cell membrane, absolutely, you'll see the cell membrane. It, usually, if it's elongated, the cells become circular, and it's a way that the cell is trying to preserve itself. And there's also, for ciprofloxacin, for example, the, the, the cells, when they start to replicate, they become longer. So that's a way of how it preserves itself. It doesn't grow, it doesn't divide, it just, looks like it's divided, but it's just a really long cell. And usually they, they remain that way until the drug has dissipated essentially, because the good thing about the thing they wait for essentially is either the drug's half-life, meaning the drug just disintegrates after a certain out number of hours, it starts to degrade, or also the body will degrade it in any way. So bacteria sometimes cessate and means they stop growing. And if they stop growing, the drug that targets the thing that's growing, it doesn't target anymore. So they sometimes stop. So that's the time you can see a morphology change. The other change you see sometimes that uh, in some bacteria, they overproduce a mucus-like um, structure outside the cell is called a capsule. And this is the mucus is as it sounds, it's really thick, nothing can get through. So no molecules can get through. So you get that sometimes with Klebsiella pneumonia, which is always in, it's in hospitals and in ICUs, that the Klebsiella in itself produces this very thick mucus layer that nothing can get through. And that's how they survive. So again, there is some changes and then, but there sometimes there's no changes you can visibly see. But that was a great question. Um, for those that asked that. Thanks, Fran. Were there any more that I should answer before I move on? We've, we've got a few, but I think we let's save them to the end of this section and then we'll we'll ask them then. Super. Oh, I should be moving on. OK, so there's different ways and this is kind of answers adds to the question that you said. So you may not be able to visibly see it, but this is what, as I said, intrinsic resistance is. It pumps it out. But what happens with bacteria? They have a signal that tells them, hey, produce more 
produce more of these. So they just have multiple extrusions. So it means they're just extruding drug a lot more and pump it out like crazy. And so E. coli does this really well. So you'll see that when it's exposed to a drug, it just suddenly multiplies the number of efflux pumps there are. Um, the second thing they have is you can have a enzyme that they have and they would degrade the actual antibiotic. And so this is what you have sometimes. So degrading the antibiotic could be a way that it does it. Uh, another way is that it changes, and this is where the mutation comes in, that it changes the appearance of the target. So if where this is the drug that's the target, a mutation may occur in some way in the, the gene or the genomic sequencing, and then it, it changes the actual structure of what the, the target was. The drug no longer recognizes. If you guys have done uh, enzyme genetics, it's a lock and, uh, key and lock mechanism, but it no longer recognizes the, the target. So then the bacteria can continue to survive. And then next thing is the porins. If you remember, this is the route that basically nutrients come into the bacteria. But when a mutation happens in the actual porins themselves, it narrows the entryway so the drugs no longer can get through. So again, that's a way that resistance um, occurs. Another way to change the restrict the entry of a drug, and this happens with some of the ICU bugs like Asymptomata baumannii, and whereby the drug, which is like colistin, it's a positively charged molecule, and the cell membrane of bacteria is actually negatively charged, and this is because of a structure called the LPS, which is the lipopolysaccharide. That's negatively charged, and also the, pho the phosphate head of the cell membrane is negatively charged. What happens? In the intracellularly, there's a, a, a signal that says, oh, we've got this drug that's positively charged. Let's change the charge of our cell membrane. So what happens, they create, starts to produce a, mo a molecule which is uh, positively charged and repels the actual drug so that it just becomes naturally resistant. And they maintain this as the, as, as the, the drug is present, they will just change this to a positively charged and then they survive, which is probably the most clever thing I've ever seen. <laughs> Uh, but you can see that also in a microscope when you see it happen it's very cool um but again just to quickly switch on so we have time to talk about my very boring career uh, again so when you're looking at exogenous sources bacteria and this is mainly for gram negative bacteria can acquire resistance and this is not just by mutation but genes from other bacteria uh, and this is why we say mainly from E. coli, it's really cook your meat as always, because if you do not cook your meat, you'll get very sick, essentially. And I, this is just kind of a PSA that E. coli does this, but it, it's a lot of gram negative bacteria can also do this and some gram positive, but I'll show you in the next slide. This is the basic structure of the bacteria. Things to notice here is just the, this is the DNA. And then we've got these exogenous autonomous genomic molecules called plasmids. Plasmids is where we bacteria have evolved to have things like mercury resistance and uh, they can metabolize cool things. But what has evolved now, it's the powerhouse of antimicrobial resistance genes and also virulence genes. And I say virulence, like if you've got a toxin, it will probably be on the plasmid and not on the chromosome. So this would be the chromosome, these are the plasmids. And pay attention because this is, will become more clear in the next couple of slides. So there's three ways bacteria can acquire, three main ways bacteria can acquire resistance. The first one, and this is mainly seen with gram positives, uh, but I'll go through each one of them specifically. So this is called transformation where they just acquire DNA from floating around. And then the second one, they've got phages that infect the bacteria and transfer DNA. And then we've got the plasmids. So when we look at phages, and this kind of goes back into the first question that the person was asking, um, when bacteria become resistant, so this is actually a gram negative, but when they become resistant, this should be a rod shape. And as you can see, when it becomes resistant, it's become circular. So that's what I mean, this cell shape changes, but the cells around it become, they, they burst because of this particular drug. But the point of this picture that I had here was to show you that all these, when a cell bursts, it's ugly and it's full of everything, but that DNA becomes free. Now, if the bacteria is naturally competent, but only few of these are, which is streptococcus pneumonia, which causes um, upper respiratory tract infections, it can just have, it's called a competent cell because it's, it's kind of a leaky cell wall that allows it to have natural competence, meaning it'll just take up any DNA at random and incorporate into its genome. And then that's how it gets resistant. So it's a really cool 
um, natural competency that very few bacteria can have. The other cool way that you normally get infections, so bacteria can get infections from phages, they're called phages, there's a only specific to bacteria, they only infect bacteria. So in fact, in biotechnology, we use them uh, as a way of changing the DNA of bacteria. So it's a really easy way to kind of do some genetic manipulation of the bacteria. Like if you're studying drug resistance, this is a way. But what happens is when a phage is in a cell, it will take up the DNA of interest, and this is, happens at random, obviously. And then it will affect another bacteria and gives to the recipient cell, and this one will also become resistant. And this is just a picture of showing that phage exists and there's sometimes different shape this is a i think a p2 phage so it's a bit longer in the i think it's called the pillars region but whatever. it's very it's just a, a particular phage that will affect very specific bacteria so again they also get colds this is their version of colds they're everywhere the last and most interesting and this is where i did my phd one was when bacteria who can conjugate and this is when they can transfer the plasmids that i said when they're close enough in proximity, and this happens naturally, they don't need a signal. As long as they're close enough to, to each other, they they create this pillus. It's called it's called a sex pillus, but it's a pillus that is basically a hollow tube that allows the plasmid to double, basically replicate, and then gives one copy to the donor. So now they become both resistant. And again, there's no the only signal is that they're close enough to each other and it's realized this one does not have the plasmid so you can get the plasmid it's a bit more complicated but it's not worth getting into now but this is essentially how resistance is transferred from one cell to another without the exposure of an overdrug at all so this one will become immediately resistant so this is essentially largely at the moment how resistance is going transferring globally even though it's, this one has never seen the drug it's immediately resistant to it that's why it becomes really, really dangerous. I don't know if we have time for, I'm seeing we're running out of time, but I'll quickly finish with this one question. Like, what do you think the, uh, this is probably a bit of a cheat, but uh, hopefully you've been paying attention if you can answer that question. Uh, how do bacteria become resistant to antibiotics? The responses are flooding in. And so far, Oh, this change. Yep. So quite a lot are going all of the above. Okay. And but we have got a few that are saying altering the target, degrading the, the drug, preventing it from entering the cell, the drug that is preventing the drug from entering the cell. So yeah. But yeah. all of the above, 93% so far is definitely going for all of the above. I love it. That's excellent. All of the above. That's correct. Absolutely. It can do all of the above. There's some that can only do one, but it's actually largely all of the above. So well done. And I'm thankful that you people are still with me. And don't worry, I'm almost wrapping up. This is just the slide. This is just to give you, this came out, it's a WHO report that came out a while ago. And it's just showing you that the problem really is, is, is global. In fact, these numbers have increased largely, even though the world is dealing with a pandemic. At the moment, the really bacterial infections are still really, really rife, and it's still a huge problem across the world. So it's not just a problem um, in sub-Saharan Africa or Asia. It's really a global problem, and it's absolutely everywhere. So we have to be mindful of trying to limit resistance and trying to battle it. And one of those things in the Global Action Plan for WHO is, again, trying to limit these things with the risk factors so trying to reduce the overuse of antibiotics and also reduce the kind of prophylactic use in, in livestock and clean up hospitals so again that's kind of where we're at with resistance the situation isn't good uh, but again now with the action planning and local action planning plus global action planning we're coming together with governments to try and control the prescription of drugs and also encouraging and having incentives for companies to create new drugs would be good. So that's kind of where, where we're at at the moment with antimicrobial resistance and antibiotics. Um, but with that, I think we can open the question. That's actually my last slide. So um, Brilliant. Well, we've got, we've got quite a few flowing in. So I, there's a few that I'll, I might merge. So you, you've sort of um, slightly touched on it, but Jed has asked, um, obviously, what is the main problem we're facing today as a result of antibiotic resistance? And are there any alternatives to antibiotics um, that can be effective? A great question. Um, is there an alternative to antibiotics? Specific for bacteria, no, there's really no alternative. Uh, once you're, you're very sick, obviously, the alternative is not to take 
uh, antibiotics if it can be um, if your body can fight it itself. Or usually, it's food poisoning and stuff, so you wouldn't be given antibiotics. But is there an alternative? No. And also, how is there a lot being done? So the the issue with current the issue with antibiotics at the moment developing new antibiotics one is very expensive to do that so for example i did my phd on it four years and we still were looking at how we can use two old drugs sometimes that's what we call combination therapy and we borrowed that um, treatment regimen from hiv because hiv used two therapies so they combine therapies to be able to to interact so you weaken the cell wall so another drug can go in and that's probably the easiest we've found that's useful the other thing is trying to develop new drugs you're trying to you're playing catch up the moment it's developed it becomes resistant immediately but the main question the main thing is it's very expensive to do that research and then to get the drug approved through fda but now with um all the approval of the, the kind of the governmental organizations is faster because of of covid but still it takes about 10 years for a drug to come to market that is effective. Brilliant. Um, so Vicheline asked, um, so similar to how there's bacteria resistance, multiple drugs or pan drug resistance, are there antibiotics that can treat multiple strains of the same bacteria or are antibiotics very specific to particular bacteria? That's an excellent question. I feel this is someone who has some inside track. That was excellent. Yes, there's wonderful bacteria, bacteria antibiotics. When you get when you go to hospitals, they're called broad range, um, broad spectrum antibiotics, and those really act on all of gram negative bacteria. And we have a similar uh, selection for gram positive bacteria. But for gram negatives, there's a broad range, and those are usually fall into two classes, and that that's what they'll save to treat you in hospitals on IV, IV drugs. So that those are usually never um, tablets for you to take home. Ian, um, this, is, this is quite an insightful one. Do we know, um, this is Martin, do we know why it seems vancomycin and erythromycin seem to remain effective for considerably longer than most other antimicrobials? Okay, so yeah, those are two different drugs. This is somebody who's very, very uh, up on on the law. So vancomycin is it's a really nice drug. One because gram negative haven't really seen it, so it's a small that you can get through the. Um, it's so vancomycin for gram positive bacteria sometimes doesn't work because even though it's small, it doesn't get through the peptidoglycan really well. But then it's maintained itself because vancomycin resistant is a particular gene but it's not really on plasmid so it's it's not really transferred so that's why it's been limited as to where you see vancomycin resistance because it's not like penicillin where that's transferred with plasmids and it's really it's basically everywhere uh with erythromycin uh i'm trying to remember that is a protein synthesis so that is limited to salmonella because salmonella is a livestock a largely livestock one. It depends on which salmonella you're looking at. But if it's typhimurium, that's a livestock one, but also infects humans. But that is on a plasmid, but it's a plasmid that is mainly floats around salmonella. So it's very rare that it comes, a specific plasmid that very rarely comes into contact with E. coli. But yeah, there's it's still a good enough drug to be able to treat with. But if you treat them with both, it's pretty good. But um, hopefully I've answered your question. Oh, there's so many good ones coming in. Um, so Jamie has asked, can you create vaccines for bacteria? Great question. That is a really hot topic at the moment. So yes, there's discussions as to trying antibodies as a, as a vaccine. So because bacteria real live harmlessly in your gut, you can't have a vaccine that targets everything because you'll ruin your gut completely and then it'll only have room for your gut will basically be empty and maybe you'll lose like five kilograms because of no bacteria but the reason why vaccines would be antibody targeted is because you'll only target ones that cause infection so for example there's only very specific strains of e coli and klebsiella for example that cause the infection so with antibodies is seeming that it's a it's a good treatment so not quite vaccine but treatment so vaccines are good for eliminating bugs for example um yellow fever, but then because we need bacteria, we can't eliminate them. 
brilliant. There's so many good ones. So um, obviously I realise you've not talked about your career elements so far, but I'm going to ask one more science one. And if we haven't asked your question, what we'll do is I'll copy all these down and then we'll put all the questions and the answers in the email, follow up email. OK, because there's so many good ones. Um, but my last one that I saw was a cracker was uh, Rosie. How do bacteria communicate with each other in order to become resistance? Um, is that? Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Whoever asked that, first of all, it's my favorite, but I never quite got to study too much. They have this system called quorum sensing, and they do this as well. Uh, you can find that with bacteria sometimes. They have, they keep growing and multiplying, and then when they know they've hit critical mass is when they would release the toxins. So you get that with E. coli, the sugar toxic E. coli, that they sense that there's enough of them of biomass that they can release the toxin at the same time, and then you get very sick after a few hours of eating raw meat. So yes, it's called quorum sensing, and it's just small micromolecules, and they, they sense that the concentration of these molecules are enough to be able to sort of simultaneously release whatever they're planning to release. Yeah. yeah. Also, I said I said I only do us one more, but this one came in really early and I still want to, uh, I think it's a good question to ask. So if our Alexandra Fleming hadn't left the Petri dish out and discovered penicillin, how long do you think it would have taken us to discover antibiotics? Honestly, that was per chance. And at the time, oh, that's a really good question. I, yeah, I that's a stinker in it. <laughs> yeah, probably be a long time because labs have only gotten cleaner. That back in the day, you'd have a lab with an open window. Most labs know where there's no open window. In fact, you can't have an open window in a lab at the moment. So probably, I don't know, hazard a guess and say never. This was it was a perfect storm of chance. Great question. Brilliant. So we've got about five minutes left. So um, obviously, we always like to to highlight people's career journeys. So do you want to you know in a whistle stop tell us? How did you come to be a bioinformatician? Yeah, in fact, the whistle stop is my preferred mechanism. So I'll be able to do this in three minutes because <laughs> my career journey is, is rather linear in the sense that I've kind of just gone from one expertise to another. So I did my undergrad in Imperial College and I did it in biochemistry. So very much it's not biology and chemistry, it's just the if you're interested in the chemistry of cells, essentially. So it was a really fun time. And then I really start to enjoy infectious diseases. I then did my mass, went on to, uh, my, to do my masters at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine on molecular biology of infectious diseases, because I found it really interesting. Oh, I should say I got into infectious disease because I did a year in industry at GSK, and that was in HIV. I then did my master's project in HIV too, as well. And then I moved on to do my PhD at the VL, well, it was the time it was the veterinary lab agency, now it's called the Animal and Plant Health Agency. And there I did my work on plasmids and E. coli. So it was a fun, fun event. And I was there for four years. And then as soon as I finished my PhD within, actually they overlapped, I went to do start my postdoc at Sanger and that was looking at antimicrobial resistance and identifying um, sort of intrinsic mechanisms of resistance in uh, four different gram negative bacteria. Um, and I did it also with some gram positive and gram negative. Uh, but yeah, that's what I did. And I started to in begin my bioinformatics journey here. So I'm quite late into the, I didn't do it in my undergrad at all. Um, but I started to sense what it was to be a bioinformatician here and got into scripting and doing all the bioinformatic pipelines and all that exciting stuff. I then moved to Vietnam to do a, se a, a second postdoc. Um, and there I was looking at infectious outbreaks um, adjacent to a hospital, but largely with a, a really, really talented team out in Vietnam. And this was with the Oxford University Clinical Research Institute. So I was there for a year and a half. I then moved back to the UK where I was a genome biologist at the NDM School of Tropical Medicine, which is also part of Oxford, but I was looking there, I was doing the analysis for typhi and looking at antimicrobial resistance in typhi. And then I left uh, Oxford and came back to Sangam. So, and then that's where I'm a principal bioinformatician, but now I largely train professionals in bioinformatics. And um, as of, in fact, this is my swan song, I will be leaving Sanger in a month to move on to be a product manager at Genomics England. So it's a real career change, but that's pretty much it as a whistle stop too. I think I managed to do that in two minutes, Fran. <laughs> Brilliant, I love it. And um, actually there's been, um been a question about how to how to get into informatics um from anas um 
so how how do you how do you um pursue it could you go to sanger and do a master's do you do a phd uh, or you know are there other routes into to informatics oh great question yes absolutely so as i said i came from wet lab and there's professional courses so sanger has really good courses that you can do on at Vulcan Connecting Science, and they you can learn bioinformatics from them. That's a really nice intro into bioinformatics, but it's always good to do it when you have data. So you have access to somebody who's sequencing, and sequencing is also now ubiquitous. If you've got some data and you go to those courses, you can learn it without having any background in bioinformatics. And it's a really slow process, but a fun process. Secondly, again, you can do masters. There's masters at, on campus. Again, I think there'll be details. You can look on the website. There's masters every year. And also you can do a PhD in bioinformatics. Again, all those are option as well. But if you did, bio, like, bio, you can have bioinformatics undergrads, I think, now as well. So. Fantastic. Brilliant. Um... Well, I think this is a nice one to finish on. Uh, do you have any recommendations for the kind of opportunities a student interested in genomics could do to find out more about the field? Um, sorry, what was that? Activities? Uh, or just, yeah, any op what sort of opportunities could a student interested in genomics do to find out more about the field? I would say the first thing, for me, I think what was useful first to get a feel of it, if you can get an internship in... in a bioinformatics institute is always great. Uh, becoming a research assistant or something that's close enough to it. Um, there's also really nice open days that I think the Sanger do as well as the Royal Society does. And I was I went to one of those Royal Society. Go to that; it's excellent. You can even see the machines that are used for genomic sequencing. Get a feel, and then you kind of understand and talk to actual researchers who are there. So I think slowly exposing yourself to these things and go to talks that like these that are interesting and. Um, yeah, look for opportunities. Some, some in master's projects sometimes or undergrad projects, the summer projects, I'd also encourage you to do that and volunteer in a lab. That's always really good. We had those in our undergrad. If you just volunteer to be in a lab for the summer, good fun. Yeah, definitely agree. Um, you know, organizations, I, I know with COVID um, at the moment, work experience is, is tricky, but um, there are organizations looking at doing virtual work experience. Um, you know, you know, broaden your horizons by doing talks like Genomics Light because that really, you know, is going to give you insights into different things. Um, there is question is, is the Sanger offering virtual work experience for A-level students? We would really like to. Um, it, it's down to capacity. It is something I'm working on. So watch this space is what I will say. Um, I will do my best to try and do something um, for that. But yeah, we are looking into doing that, whether it's this year or next year. Um, we are definitely looking at immersive experiences online and, and actually on campus as well. But, um, you know, ask your teachers, can you come and visit the Sanger Institute? Um, because we do we do offer school visits, um, you know, to the campus. Um, we do open when, when it, we're back to normal, um, open Saturdays where you can come onto campus as well. So definitely look out for those sort of things. Um, if you we have got an, uh, a mailing list. So if you're interested in those opportunities, um, email us at education at welcomeconnectingscience.org and we will add you to our mailing list. But I think that ends up quite nicely. But yeah, get experience where you can. If this this is such a cool area um, and it's only going to get you know more and more important. We're already going through one pandemic. We don't want an antimicrobial resistance pandemic to go through in the future. So the more scientists on this topic, the better. Thank you so much, Christine. That was so interesting. It was, yeah, I was just, I was just loving it. Um, my main takeaway is I'm never going to let any of my family go near a toilet, to, certainly not drink toilet water. Um, that is quite horrific. Um, so, but yes, um, but also just the whole idea of pan drugs, um, pan, you know, the, 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 the ones that are so resistant to everything that is quite scary but really hope everyone's enjoyed it um we will be um sending the recordings out probably next week um i've been noting down the questions that we haven't been able to answer so i will put those in the uh, follow-up email as well thank you so much everyone i hope you have a lovely email um email what am i talking about lovely evening i, I need a cup of tea i'm sure everyone else does um but thank you so much Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Brian. Cheers, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.